Listen, I get that it's common for authors to write under fake names, but it is not normal for a first-time author to sell the movie rights to their book for $200 million. It just doesn't add up. Today on the podcast, who is Ali Conway and why do some people think he might be Taylor Swift? I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. Okay, so today we're doing something we haven't done on the show before. We're going to try to solve a mystery. There is a new thriller novel called Argyle. It is out today, but it's already had people combing for clues for months. And that's because the book is by Ellie Conway, an author no one seems to have heard of, no pictures on the internet. No trace, nothing. And despite all the mystery surrounding who wrote this novel, in just a few weeks, we're also going to get a movie adaptation of it. Argyle, the film, comes out February 2nd. And it has massive stars. It has Bryce Dallas Howard, Dua Lipa, Henry Cavill. It is about an author who writes spy novels, who discovers that her books are exposing top secret missions, and now she has every spy agency after her. But here's the thing. Ellie Conway is both the name of the author in the movie and the pseudonym of the writer of the real-life book, Argyle. And this is driving me crazy. Who is Ellie Conway? And are Taylor Swift fans onto something? I caught up with the author Heather Marshall and Professor Ellie McCausland to talk about all of this. And Heather started out by describing why there's so much mystery surrounding this book. First was that Apple paid $200 million for the film option to Argyle, which is an eye-watering amount of money on any day, yeah. but particularly for a film option on spec for an unpublished book by a debut author that's almost unprecedented. It's bonkers. Now, at the time, this debut author doesn't even have an online presence. Nothing is known about them, as you said. Mm-hmm. There were several things I also found strange. There was next to no advance copies sent out to media or readers, which is, again, very unusual, because especially for debut authors, they want to get those books out early to generate buzz. Um, I thought for a book this size, a movie this size, you know, Ellie Conway would have been trotted out on tour, media interviews. Mm -hmm. They would have had her face everywhere. And there are also no other author endorsements. The only endorsement on Argyle is Matthew Vaughn, the director, going, (laughs) this is the best thing since James Bond, and we're supposed to believe him. (laughs) So I think the question kind of naturally arose, like, who is Ellie Conway and why was she paid this staggering amount of money to make her book or books into movies. Uh, Ellie, before I ask you the question, I just got to say, Heather said she's no expert, but that's not true. She wrote Looking for Jane and (laughs) sold like a billion copies. And we're just going to pretend like you can't just pretend like you don't have expertise in this, Heather. I can't let you off the hook when it comes to this. Uh, Ellie, I feel like so many news stories these days end, end with this is how also Taylor Swift is involved. But this right? one yeah. this one seems to have a bit more weight for people. It's holding a lot of weight for people. How did we get from, hey, this is kind of a weird thing happening here to ah, uh, this is this might be Taylor Swift. Yeah. Um it's it's a leap. It's several leaps. <laughs> okay. Um several uh so okay, so there's a couple of things at play here. Firstly, there is a kind of precedent for this in that um a few months ago there was a book um so there was kind of chatter among the sort of publishing uh, writers world that there was um a book that was coming out i think it's this year um and it, there was no information about who the author was but it had been commissioned for a really high sort of sum of money and yes. rumors circulated on the internet that it was taylor swift it was by Taylor Swift. It was a kind of uh, autobiography. It turned out to not be. It turned out to be, I think, by a, a K-pop group. It was BTS. As far as I yeah, remember. Right. Yeah. That's the one. There we go. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's not the first time that Swift has been linked to kind of publishing phenomena. But with Argyle, there seemed to be an additional series of clues. So you you may know that, that Swifties, so Swift's fans, are forensic in their analysis <laughs> of the kind of Easter eggs that she peppers it through her, her music and her lyrics. And Fans have supposedly identified some of these in the kind of promo and buzz around Argyle. So the main ones are the promo poster for Argyle talks about letting the cat out of the bag and it features a cat backpack, very similar to the one that Taylor Swift herself has in the documentary Miss Americana with the same kind of cat that Taylor Swift also has. 
The Ellie Conway um, was also a character in the Australian soap Neighbours, um, and her debut in that soap was on December the 13th, which is famously Taylor Swift's birthday. Yes, it is. And our file contains the word, the name Ellie. Great name, by the way, I have to say. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, but but that seems to be, those are the clues. But I think it's, it's as Heather was saying, it's the, the absolute weirdness of what is going on here mm-hmm. um, that makes people think that, you know, this author can't just be a random debut author. It's it's someone big to make to generate this kind of buzz and money and secrecy as well. Heather, off the radio, we've talked about this and we've talked about <laughs> um, the idea of maybe moving a little bit closer to being like, ah, I could see how it's Taylor mm-hmm. Swift. What's the thing that made you go, you know what? I think it could be her. I think Ashley really could be Taylor Swift to play here. So I will try to keep this summarized because Alameen actually has about 31 minute long voice notes for me <laughs> I when really I was outlining do. this. I'll keep it short. Um, so I'll be honest, I've been having loads of fun with this theory that it could be Taylor Swift. I actually saw a TikTok back at the end of October that someone sent me suggesting this. And I thought, oh, there go the Swifties again. This is cute. Let's see what this is about. Right. I actually <laughs> went in very open-minded, um, found out all the things that Ellie just outlined, and then did a bit more reading and digging a little deeper and started to really wonder if this might be true. Um, The name Ellie Conway, all those numbers 13 on Ellie Conway's Instagram page, all of the comments are just people tearing apart each Instagram post looking for references. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But it was that, like, as Ellie was kind of just saying, you know, that that $200 million option made me think, okay, this is someone huge. Mm -hmm. And right now, no one is bigger than Taylor Swift. Mm. Time Magazine's Person of the Year, I could go on, this investment clearly means they know that this is a slam dunk based on some X factor. And as Ellie was just alluding to, you know, and Nelly and you and I talked about this, no one can keep a secret locked down tighter than Taylor Swift, mm-hmm. even when there are hundreds of people involved in it. It's incredible. I do have to acknowledge that like whatever, you know, promotional account was created under the name Ellie Conway um, did tweet saying, hey, I'm not Taylor Swift. And it made me go, yeah, sure, buddy. Sure, I totally believe right. you, Taylor. That's what Taylor Swift would say if she wanted to be <laughs> yes. Taylor Swift. <laughs> uh, for, it's, it's, it is a staggering amount of money. The idea that, you know, like this is um, a first-time author. Like, it, who else? It's like it's either Oprah just wrote a spy novel, <laughs> you know, or Taylor Swift did it. Because I can't, I can't think of somebody else who can merit that amount of money. Ellie, we should say you teach Taylor, a Taylor Swift course in Belgium. You study her lyrics. We asked her to read the book. Do you think it's written in any kind of way in the style of Taylor Swift? No. Honestly, I have <laughs> oh, to say. Wow, that's so definitive. Okay, continue. Yes. I, okay, I'll, I'm going to be probably hounded for saying this. Um, I'm almost too scared to go on record and say it. But <laughs> oh, no. If this, if this book is written by Taylor Swift, she should stick to music. Um, <laughs> I had seen because the word amateur battered around, battered around. It's okay. I'm just gonna give me just give, give me 20 seconds. I just have to get this out. Of my system. Go for it. Go for it. This book is one of the most derivative, <laughs> cliche-filled, <laughs> trope-filled, unoriginal novels I have ever read. I enjoyed it. But let me just say, I really enjoyed it. The plot. The plot is great because it's the plot of every other spy thriller. It's got everything. It's it's just everything you'd expect from a kind of James Bond-esque novel. There's nothing original about it, which means it's very entertaining, you know, because mm-hmm. it is very formulaic. Yeah. But the writing, it's it's so cliched. And I think one of the things about Taylor Swift is that she she's her lyrics are original so they've got yeah. a poetic twist she she mm. puts a new twist on things there is none of that in this novel mm. um you know I, as i say i did enjoy reading it it's a great gripping read if you like a kind of cheesy spy novel i see not an ounce of taylor swift in it um, if i'm honest I, I mean she uses the, the the phrase all too well at one point but that's about <laughs> as close as i got I've... and also I, I i saw that sorry once one more thing i saw this on social media you know someone pointed out that we one would hope that if if Taylor Swift had written it, there'd be a kind of you know strong female protagonist. Yeah, but there isn't. It's not. It's not great mm. in its portrayal of women. I have to say. Um, 
Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not convinced. If I'm so, honest. So you're not buying the Matthew Vaughn this no. will reinvent the spy genre <laughs> yeah. kind of claim. Oh my goodness, that makes me so angry. There's no, there's no reinvention here whatsoever. This is a standard. It's, it's so derivative. I just, I don't understand what the fuss is about. Okay, we, we, we have to talk about the idea that if there's all this kind of promotional machine and this, you know, the idea that the Apple spent two hundred million dollars on this thing, and it is this derivative thing that you're talking about, Ellie, like Heather. What is the idea that you know promotion uh, sort of outsizes more than any, more than anything else? Like it, it, promotion plays a bigger role than anything else. Um, what does that tell you about the publishing industry right now? Oh, I mean, I think we're on the precipice of some big changes, and mm. this is fascinating from a from a publishing and art perspective, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the the promotion has been huge, but also very mysterious, which is strange. And I think that's kind of, you know, feeding the curiosity about it. If I can kind of segue a little bit, there is another theory circulating, and this might, again, kind of align with what Ellie was saying about the book, that it actually could have been written by AI. In which case, you know, would would AI kind of scrape the internet for those tropes and cliches and yeah. also popular celebrity material to generate a narrative? And again, what is more popular right now than kind of the Taylor Swift theme, if you will? There would be big money in that. And we know that the people involved in this are playing with really big money. So for promotion, is that, you know, I, I think it opens up a whole other conversation about whether that's disingenuous to kind of use that aesthetic and that theme. Um, But would you ride those coattails to success? Potentially. Well, so so I'm now taking the f- from the highs to the lows. Like, oh my mm-hmm. gosh, it could be a Taylor Swift book too. Oh no, it could be an AI <laughs> novel. And I think yeah. both of those options are, you know, like they're very telling in their own ways in terms of the directions uh, that the publishing industry is going. Uh, literally 30 seconds to each of you. If you had to make a guess as to who the real identity of Ellie Conway is, uh, just have some fun here. 30 seconds to you, Ellie. Who would you guess it might be? I think it's a collaboration between Matthew Vaughan, maybe mm. some AI involved and maybe a ghostwriter. And I actually see the whole thing as a massive experiment, a kind of meta commentary on the publishing industry, the film industry, a, an attempt to sort of shake things up, shake up how we do things to make some kind of point, whether that point <laughs> is that AI can produce something good, whether the point is that we need to start changing how we publish and how we make movies. Yeah. I think it's a kind of giant postmodern meta something that eventually the cat will come out of the bag and I'm excited to see what is in that bag. That's a very expensive experiment. Heather, last word to you. I agree. So if it's not Taylor Swift, who else? I have no specific name because of all the things that sort of point to her, but I do believe it is either someone huge or no one at all. So as, as Ali was saying, <laughs> yeah. that it's some kind of, I think that's of, a know, very yeah, fast statement. Yeah, like a meta smoke screen set up to kind of reflect the movie's character, Ellie Conway, while having this other kind of, you know, social and political commentary. Um, it's it's very, oh, it's so curious. I can't wait to find out. And the film itself <laughs> is very meta, right? Like, I, from yes. what I can hear about the film, it, like, the film itself is going to be doing that kind of postmodern meta-filmic yeah. thing, yes. which means that You've got a kind of meta film about an author writing a book that's become a film that's maybe actually about a, a author that isn't real. You know, there's, I, uh, I, think mm-hmm. it's really, I think it's really fun. I, I, mean, think, I think we're going to really have fun curious. with it. Like, what yeah. we learned yeah. here is that like, no matter what it is, no matter who it is, they've given us a few weeks of fun. And for that, I'm grateful. I love, right. So let's leave it here. And you know what? We're going to revisit this conversation depending on if we ever find out <laughs> who Ellie Conway is. Ellie, Heather, I really appreciate you guys being here. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Thank Alameen. You. Ellie McCausland is a professor and author. She's a te- she's teaching a literature course about Taylor Swift at Ghent University in Belgium. Heather Marshall is the author of the best-selling novel Looking for Jane. I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud, and you're listening to Commotion. Listen, we're going to shift gears a little bit because I want to talk about theater. A theater in BC has canceled its production of a play that deals with violence in the Middle East because of the war in the Middle East. The play is called The Runner. It's by Toronto playwright Christopher Morris, and it's about an Israeli search and rescue group and the aftermath of terror attacks. The lead character in this play is forced to decide between allegiance to his own side and saving a Palestinian woman. 
Now, here's the thing. When the Belfry Theatre in Victoria decided to stage the runner, there was backlash. And now there's backlash because it's been cancelled. Ashley Murphy is a theater critic who's following the controversy. And just a bit of a caution here. Some of the descriptions you're about to hear might be difficult for some listeners. I started out by talking to Ashling, and she started telling me a bit more about the play. It is about this Israeli member of, of this organization called Zaka, whose job is to collect the bodies in the aftermath of terrorist attacks and mm. natural disasters. It starts off with what I imagine is a fairly commonplace day for for a member of Zaka, which Mm. is he is there to recover the body of a dead Jewish person in Israel. Um, And he realizes that on the ground near this person is a knife. And then he sort of turns around and realizes, oh, there is a Palestinian young woman who is bleeding out. She's not dead, but she is severely, severely wounded. Mm. Um, And ultimately, he decides to save her. He gives her CPR Um, There's a moment in the play that's incredibly visceral and graphic, but I think also shows a lot of the intent of the play where she actually coughs up quite a bit of blood into his mouth as he's giving her CPR, Mm. which if you know anything about um, like keeping kosher, that's incredibly, you you can't do that. Um, And he he spends much of the play reflecting on that. And the play really turns into a case of you know, why Why did I save her instead of doing my job first? Did I do the right thing by saving her instead of doing my job first? And I think ultimately he does decide that, yes, he did do the right thing. And, and the system should not be penalizing him for saving for saving an alive person over um, recovering a dead person. Like, it really does turn into a story of, am I there to save people? Is, is this a humanitarian effort? Or mm. am I there to perpetuate the ideals of the Israeli state? Uh, I was going to say that, like, it also, in addition to the complexity, it just sounds like it is in a very direct, literal way speaking to the moment. And like, you don't, you very rarely get pieces of art that are so speaking to the moment so directly um, as this one. We should also say, like, this isn't some kind of fringe production. Like, if this is a, a play that came out in 2019, has been staged in six cities. Back in 2019, it won the Dora Mavor Moore Awards for Outstanding Production, Outstanding Direction, Outstanding New Play. Um, just talk a little bit about the moment that it's landing in. How do you understand, you know, how do the people who are putting on this play sort of understand how they're in conversation with the new cycle right now? I mean, what's so kind of interesting about this play and and, in conversations I've had with colleagues since this controversy sort of broke out, this play really could have been about any place or anything. Mm. Um, You you know, the um, Christopher Morris is not himself Israeli. He doesn't have a particularly strong personal connection to this conflict. All this to say, this could have been a play that was produced in 2022 uh, mm. set in Ukraine and about, like about any other soldier. conflict you mean exactly it being programmed right now it is an unfortunate moment for for it to be programmed because I do agree that you know this play whether or not people realize it you know whether or not people have read the play or really understand it fully before going to see it I think people may sort of hear that one line summary and think no this is harmful mm. and I, I understand that understanding it's just also not complete because it's not taking in the full uh, intent of the play and, and what the play actually does cover. Okay, so now we got to talk about the backlash. Describe the backlash that the Belfry Theatre in Victoria got once they announced that they're going to do this play. Um, the backlash came in the form of two petitions. So you have the pro-Palestinian petition, which was asking the Belfry Theatre to cancel this play, uh, saying that this is causing active harm to the Palestinian community. Hmm. Uh, so please cancel it. And then you have the not pro-Palestinian um uh, petition saying, "Hey, th- this play is here to do more that, than than what what it says in that in one sentence summary. Please don't cancel it. It's an important play. It should happen." Mm-hmm. Um, and ultimately, the Belfry did decide to cancel it. Um, and I think for me, where that's sitting is, you know, I think canceling it might have actually been the right move in in this situation. I do mm. think that in this moment, it, it is unrealistic to expect. A- everyone with an opinion to know the play intimately to, to even read the play sure um if this play is programmed could it cause more pain and suffering to the palestinian community 100 percent. and i do think that a theater has a responsibility to its communities to protect mm. them as well as they can that's a good reason to cancel a play sure. um i think canceling a play 
almost out of cowardice is not, you know, it, to me that the statement that the Belfry gave felt quite incomplete and almost mm. a case of we are saving our own image rather than we are we are helping out this community that might be affected. Uh, the Belfry got these two petitions you're talking about. But also, on the other hand, you know, um, they did – somebody sort of defaced the theater. There, there was some graffiti mm. involved um, in defacing the theater. And if you're a theater company, maybe you're trying to have the conversation of we are the place that can have this conversation that the rest of the world is trying to have. But also, on the other hand, the thing that you just mentioned, which is like in this moment, is it the right time to engage in this conversation? Are people actually able to engage in this conversation? Uh, what's your read on how theater companies should even think about those questions? I, that's not an easy question for you to answer. I just, I'm just kind of curious about what your take on that is. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's interesting because um, the Push Festival in Vancouver is moving ahead with a production of The Runner. Um, like I think with, soon, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And they've sort of, they have sort of framed it as okay, we have this, but then we also have this piece of Palestinian theater happening, so you should see both. Mm. Um, and then that messaging is also getting backlash from the community because it, it, you know, people are saying, "Hey, you can't balance balance the scale in that way. That's it's a, it's overly simplistic." So, do I think that there's a way to present the runner in this cultural moment? Maybe I think it would have to be accompanied by maybe some sort of talk back or some some sort of community engagement hmm. that's really quite thoughtful and proactive rather than. You know, hey, we programmed this play a year ago. Oh gosh, what what do we do now? Right. Now that the world has changed, what what does this whole episode tell you about like the climate in Canadian theater right now? I feel like it's all more showing that nothing has changed. Like moment to moment, conflict to conflict, Canadian theater will do as Canadian theater does. I, I say which that is what? which is what, which is I guess a nervousness, you know, approach to to conflict. Yeah, I get playing things safe mm. waiting waiting for there to be backlash before making a decisive statement or decision on on programming choices um in 2006 there was a production of the play my name is rachel Corey that was slated to be produced at canadian stage in toronto and that play uh is also very much dealing with gaza it was told from the perspective of an american activist who very much on the pro-palestinian side that play was programmed and then ultimately pulled. Um, Canadian stage said, no, it's not because of controversy. It's just because the play isn't good. Um, hmm. And yet that play has received total international acclaim everywhere else. Right. So like, not sure. Um, but we're, you know, we're having almost the exact same conversation now around another play that I think deserves to be seen and deserves to be discussed. Again, I'm just not quite sure how that happens ethically and safely in this moment. It's a it's a tough thing to hear this idea that you know between 2006 and 2024 relatively little has changed in terms of the nervousness in terms of the aversion to risky topics because theater is one of those spaces I think of theater as one of those spaces where you can be confronted with an idea and a story in a way that maybe you've not encountered it before like that is what is transformative about the medium itself do you have any hope at all that this chill in the theater world will ease up anytime soon you know i think the the most impactful Canadian theater that's dealing with these massive global events, ultimately, you know, the place that we often want to program during these moments and keep talking about after these moments is when they're some sort of first person, either solo show or, or some sort of personal reflection on the events themselves. I say that like um, there's this play, First Métis Man of Odessa, very much about the war in Ukraine told by a Ukrainian Canadian couple who was directly impacted by the war. Hmm. Um, artists will continue to make things even during conflict and especially during conflict. And my hope is that we, we do see some sort of art emerge from this that does have that personal lived experience that this conversation needs. And that's what I think is perhaps missing from The Runner and why The Runner has perhaps stirred up as much controversy as it has on the West Coast. Ashley Murphy, you're a treasurer. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Ashley Murphy is a freelance theater and culture critic based in Toronto, and you just heard Victoria, B.C.'s Belfry Theater canceled a production of The Runner after protests. However, it is slated still to run at Vancouver's Push Festival from January 24th to the 26th. That is it for the podcast today. Remember, you can listen to any episode of the show anytime you like, wherever you get your podcasts. 
By the way, tomorrow we're going to be talking about Barack Obama. We're going to be talking about the Obama list because who knew that Barack Obama suddenly becomes a cultural tastemaker, the guy who tells you what books to read and the albums to listen to. I think there's something interesting going on there. We're going to talk about that. My name is Alameen Abdul-Mahmoud. Hey, I'm going to be here tomorrow. If you're going to be here, I would love to see you then.